Well, good morning, Vine Church family. Uh, I love you so much, and I really wish that we could meet together. I wish that I was sitting in your living room with you right now. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, uh, that's how I'm going to act. I'm going to act like I'm just sitting in the living room with you, uh, chatting as if I was there because, you know, we're all stuck in our homes and uh, we can't be together. I can't be in your house. Uh, that's like against the rules right now and all that. So, but I'm going to act like it. So this is Vine Church Home Edition. Uh, this is my home here. This is where I live. I'm just in my house. Although uh, Brooke and the kids are not here because they're being way too loud. And I said, you got to go somewhere else so that I can film this video. Uh, I don't think the whole monitor screen is in the video. There we go. Uh, later on, you're going to need to be able to see that side of it. So I uh, turned it there. But uh, I just want to start off saying I love you. I, I care about you. Uh, and I'm praying for you. Brooke and I are praying for you during this time. Uh, you know, today I, I might make some jokes and I want to have a little fun. But I don't want that to be... Uh, in any way, uh, you, you feel like I'm making light of the situation that we're in. I know that we're in a serious time. Uh, we are in a serious time in the life of our country, in our city, uh, in our families. And it's important for us as believers to be praying for our leaders, be praying for the people that are governing our state, our cities, and our country, uh, so that uh, we, we pray for them so that they will make good decisions, that God will direct them during this time. Uh, I do want to have some fun because I do think it's important during this time to uh, kind of maybe break away from the news cycle and all of the information overload that we can get on that can cause fear, anxiety, uh, and all that. And I, I want to laugh a little bit, uh, yet we are going to be looking today at Luke chapter 23, which is like the darkest moment in the life of Jesus. So uh, we're going to see how this goes. Uh, we're living in, in kind of a, a, a defining moment, a dark moment uh, in the world right now. And we're going to look at the, the darkest moment of the life of Jesus and, and, and hopefully make it fun. So we'll see how that goes. But first, uh, before we jump into that, uh, a couple things just to remind you, you can always go to our website, vinetrustful.com. Uh, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. You know, we're posting random things uh, throughout this season, videos and stuff. So you can check those out on our social media channels. And also, uh, I do want to, to tell you, to implore you, to implore you, encourage you in any way I can to go to vinetrustful.com today because uh, we really want to be hearing from you. And the way that we communicate with one another is primarily through the connection card. And most of the time, Vine Church, you are so good at this family. Like you are so good. Most of the people who come uh, on the weekends fill out a connection card. And our goal is that everybody who's uh, with us on that morning to fill out a connection card. And uh, let me be honest, uh, you're not doing this right now. And I get it's totally different going online, but not many of you are filling out connection cards, like not hardly any of you, but we want to know what's going on. Like, I want to be praying for you. I want to be praying specifically for what's happening in your life. Uh, our connection card is how we apply the next steps, uh, how, how we apply what Jesus is talking to us about. So please uh, fill out that connection card. Uh, you can also give online. Now, I, I do want to say thank you so much. So many of you uh, are continuing to give, which is great because we got some really good things we want to do uh, with our giving as a church family. I talked with two different schools this past week on how we can be a help uh, during these next few months as we're all homeschool parents trying to get resources to kids uh, that they need for their house. So we're going to be doing that. I'll give you more details. I, I was hoping to tell you today. Uh, all about that and what we were doing. But honestly, the schools were like, we're just too overwhelmed getting everything ready and, and trying to get stuff by Monday that we don't even know what we need right now. Uh, but as soon as they give us a list of what they need, I'll share that with you. We're going to give towards that. If that's Chromebooks, if that's uh, other types of school supplies, we want to do that as a church family. And that's all through your giving. So thank you so much for your generosity and the fact that you've been generous and, and continue to be so. Uh, is such a wonderful blessing uh, to people around us. So three reasons why we give. We give one, to worship God, uh, out of worship to God. Number two, we give because we believe in the mission and vision of our own church family, Vine Church, that we're a part of. Three, we give because we want to be able to give out uh, to, and we want to be able to bless people who are doing good things around the world. So thank you for that. You, 
VineTrustful.com connection card. Say it with me in your house right now, out loud in front of your kids. Connection card. Now, if you're with your kids and they didn't hear you say that, kids, go up and just don't punch your parents. Tap them on the shoulder. Say, connection card. Connection. Just fill out the connection card. I love you uh, and I'm uh, really happy. If you do that, pursuing Jesus, embracing people, it's our mission statement. It's who we are. We don't have to be in a church building to pursue Jesus. We don't have to be in a church building to embrace people. Uh, so this is Home Edition. I'm excited to jump in. Luke chapter 23. The title today is Defining Moments. You know, when I think uh, back over my life, there were many, many defining moments. And I remember them with great clarity. I remember the first time I hit a home run over the fence. I love baseball. I played baseball all growing up. My dad had a deal with us that he would give us $25 the first time we hit a home run over the fence. And I still remember that moment that I hit that home run, the excitement that took place, but also it defined my life going forward. I was no longer the kid, and I didn't broadcast or anything, but I was internally, I was no longer the one who had never hit a home run, that I'd accomplished a life goal uh, of mine. I remember when I graduated high school. I remember graduating Bible college. I remember my first, mm, mm, I remember my first kiss with Brooke, with Brooke, with my wife, Brooke, people. Uh, I told Brooke earlier in the week, I asked her if it was okay for me to share that kind of little joke. And she said it was all right. And I actually tried to think of like what my actual first kiss was. And I don't even remember that very well. But I remember my first kiss with Brooke. We were, I'm not going to tell you that story, but it was a defining moment in my life. Uh, Obviously, we got married. Four kids later, 15 years of marriage, uh, coming up on 15 years of marriage. I'm so glad for that moment. It was a defining moment. I remember 9-11. I remember where I was, September 11th, 2001. I remember with painful clarity watching the towers come down. I remember the first time we took one of our kids to the hospital because we thought they were having a seizure. I remember the fear that gripped Brooke and I both during those moments. Those were defining moments in our, in our lives. You know, whenever there's a defining moment, whether it be a moment of triumph or a moment of pain or a moment of failure, whenever there's a moment that uh, maybe catches us by surprise or maybe it's, it, it's been planned, but whenever there's a moment that begins to alter our course going forward. It's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to grow, an opportunity for us to deepen our relationship with God, to deepen our relationship with our family. You know, we are living in a defining moment. We will never forget COVID-19. We will never forget this season. We will never forget uh, being locked in our homes and quarantined. We'll never forget the time that school was canceled for the whole year, or at least the uh, school buildings were canceled. We're still doing at-home learning, people. We're all homeschool parents, don't forget. But we'll never forget this season of life. We'll never forget going to the store and uh, it being completely and totally out of toilet paper, which is still funny to me that that's the thing that, that's gone. Yet, I will say, if there comes a time yet, and hopefully you're not there, and we're not there yet, but if there ever comes a time where we have to use something besides toilet paper to do the job of toilet paper, let me tell you, we will never forget that moment. But this is a defining moment in our city, in our country, in our state. This is a defining moment. And we're going to look at a defining moment today in Luke chapter 23. But it's not a defining moment just for the life of Jesus. It was a defining moment for all of history. And it was Jesus's darkest moment. It was his darkest moment. We're going to be talking about and looking at his death. But we're going to look into this story and what Jesus says, what he talks about, what he does, so we get a little bit of a picture of what is going through the mind of Christ, what is going through his mind as he is entering into his darkest, most painful moments in life. So in Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 23. It says, But the mob shouted louder and louder, 
demanding that Jesus be crucified. The same mob who loved on Jesus just a few moments earlier, a few days before when they celebrated him entering into Jerusalem, this mob is now turned and they're shouting, demanding that Jesus die. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded. As they had requested, he released Barabbas, the man in prison for insurrection and for murder. But he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. So Pilate had presented them with his choice. Should I release Jesus? And Pilate even said, I find no fault with Jesus. Or should I release Barabbas, this murderer? He was thinking that he would be able to release Jesus because he believed he was innocent. But the mob requested that he release Barabbas and that he kill Jesus. So he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. Not only was Jesus going to die on a cross, but two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Then, verse 34, we're getting a a picture into the mind of Jesus and what's going on in his life during his darkest moment. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive him, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. In Jesus' darkest moment, As he's nailed to a cross, he looks out over the mob, looks out over the crowd, looks at the religious leaders, looks at these people who have convicted him wrongfully and sentenced him to die. And he looks out at them and with love and compassion in his heart, he pleads to his father in heaven, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them because they are ignorant. They just don't understand what they're doing. You know, a few days ago, uh, I'm sitting in the living room with our kids and we're watching uh, a YouTube channel that our kids like about these guys in Texas that do trick shots. But in one of these episodes, they had to go out and build a chair. And they were given, you know, wood, screws, a drill, uh, a saw, and all the materials they would need to to build a chair. Uh, And as we're watching this, it became very apparent quickly. Two of them knew what they were doing, uh, or at least sort of, and two of them had no clue whatsoever. And it was painful to watch them try and build this chair. And we're sitting in the living room, and I'm like, no! And and I'm like talking to the TV, and the kids are like, Dad, they can't hear you. And I'm like, I know, but do you see? Like, they have no idea. This is not going to work. This, what they are doing is not going to work. And so, comes to the end, the two guys that knew what they were doing, the chairs were fine. The two guys that didn't were not fine. And immediately, our kids run downstairs and they grab, you know, the extra lumber we have laying around. And I mean, I'm not an expert builder or anything, but I've built quite a few pieces of furniture over the years. So I kind of, you know, have a general idea of what to expect. And uh, this is a home edition. Things happen. And so if you heard that, uh, Nolan, my son's, his phone just went off. Uh, I'm using it for a remote and it just beeped. But uh, the, uh, uh, and I run downstairs and they're, they're building the chairs and I'm watching them. And, and, and them, they can hear me. So I, I want to help them, want to tell them, but they're both kind of just trying to do it on their own. I was like, I'm just going to let them, let them do it on their own. And one of them, the chair worked out. One of them, eh, he might be watching this. So, you know, we'll talk in code. Like, wasn't the greatest, okay? Uh, well, I'm watching from the outside. I don't know if you've ever done this, ever looked on the outside of something taking place, thinking you have no idea what you're doing right now. And I just want to help you. Well, Jesus is on the cross and he looks out at them. He's like, you have no idea what they have. Father in heaven, they have no idea what they are doing. They don't know that they are crucifying the Messiah. They don't understand that their sins can now be forgiven because of this crucifixion. So don't hold it against them. In his darkest moments, number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus was caring for someone with less understanding. In his darkest moments, Jesus was caring for someone with less understanding. As we look out at those around us, uh, neighbors, co-workers, people that are not followers of Jesus, we have a greater understanding uh, than, than those around us. That doesn't mean we're better than them or somehow elite, Yet, we have an understanding that, uh, that this season of time is just a blip in eternity. 
we have a greater understanding than them that there is hope in Jesus. And no matter how dark things may seem, there is hope in Jesus. And Jesus was caring for someone with less understanding. During this season, during this dark time, we should have the mind of Christ. We should be thinking about others that have less understanding. And I wrote the point this way. Uh, I, I wrote it out because I could have said Jesus was caring for, for others. In his darkest moment, Jesus was caring for others, which would have been true. But I wanted to be clear. Jesus had an understanding that the people didn't have, and he cared for them because he knew something they didn't know. And, and he had a greater understanding. And so we're uh, around people now. Maybe it's our kids that have less understanding than we do. Maybe it's other loved ones, family members who, who don't follow Jesus and they don't understand the hope. It's time for us to care for those who don't have the same understanding that we do. Going on, verse 39, one of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, and Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Jesus' darkest moments, he was providing hope forever with endless grace. In Jesus' darkest moments, as he was dying on a cross, he was providing hope. Hope for every single one of us. Hope forever. Not just hope that we will make it through COVID-19 in 2020. Not just hope that things will get better one day, but hope forever. Forever. Ever in eternity, he, he turns to this criminal and says, today you will be with me in paradise. This criminal who'd made all kinds of mistakes, who, who, was, who was dying because of his sins, because of his mistakes, because he had broken the law. But with, with humility, he repents and is like, Jesus, I know you're the Messiah. And Jesus was granting hope forever. Every single one of us, we can have hope forever. And Jesus was providing that with endless Grace. Now, I use the words forever and endless for, for a reason. We are in a, in, in a time in our nation, in, in our city, in our world right now where it can be a dark moment. And if we allow ourselves maybe to get even sucked into it, it can be even darker than it needs to be. But it's a, it's a dark time. It's, it's a confusing time. It's a time of uncertainty. And during this uh, dark season, we sometimes can get hyper-focused on where we are at right here, right now. And sometimes it really helps to take a giant step back and gain a larger perspective. See, Jesus was providing hope forever. See, we get to live in eternity in heaven forever. Also, this world that we're in has been around for thousands and thousands of years. It's seen pandemics before, and life has gotten back to a new normal. Life has moved on. We have hope as followers of Jesus that he is going to carry us through no matter what takes place with this endless grace. The grace of Jesus doesn't stop. The grace of Jesus didn't stop at the cross. The grace of Jesus goes on and on and on and on and on forever because of his endless, boundless, marvelous, magnificent grace. We can have hope no matter what we're facing. No matter what we're going through, there is hope. You know, in, in times of stress, in times of weakness, it really helps to take a step back and gain hope perspective. Whenever we step back and look at things from a different angle, we can gain information. We can gain that from that perspective. We can gain information that helps us deal with the present. You know, uh, my work has been pretty go, go, go these past few weeks. Uh, if you don't know, I'm a pastor here with Vine Church, but I also do uh, website design uh, as well. And that's my full-time job because it's website design and because of the company I work for and all these changes with the COVID stuff and small business loans and, and all the things going on, my work has like ramped up and it's been really uh, busy. 
And because of that, I've gotten a little stressed and, uh, and trying to just get it all done and, and film and edit and, and produce, you know, produce and all, write them all this stuff while the work's going on and then being with the kids in the house all day long. Like every day being with the kids, you know, it's like, you know, I, I got, I can get a little stressed. And every now and then when I find myself getting stressed, pop on the headphones and I go for a little walk. And I do that because I can, for myself, I can feel like the pressure beginning to mount up. And it's like, I need some perspective. I need to walk. I need some perspective. And Jesus on the cross was providing us a, pers- a, a, a insight. He was providing for us hope forever, endless grace. And he was giving us uh, something that we can look forward to that, gain, that gives us a new perspective on whatever we're facing in the here and now. You know, a number of years ago, uh, I had hair. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't, but I used to have hair. Uh, I didn't always shave my head, and it may look like I shave my head just because I want to, and it is easy, it is low maintenance, but the reason why I shaved my head a number of years ago is because my hair decided that it was going to leave me whether I wanted it to or not. And I held out for a long time that, uh, you know, that I wasn't balding, but then... I saw this photograph, and in the photograph, it was taken from up and behind. I was down here, and the photo was from up and behind somewhere else, and I looked, and it hit me. I was like, oh, man, that guy there's got a pretty big bald spot on the back of his head, and then it it hit me. That was me. That was my bald spot, and I thought, oh, no. That means everyone taller than me, this is the view they see, and guess how many people are taller than me? Yeah, like a whole lot of people, like most people are taller than me. Uh, I know I may look tall on video, but all of you in our church family, you know, I'm not. And I saw that and I was like, ooh, new perspective, learn something new. I'm gonna start shaving my head. So let's just get this thing over with. Whenever we, and that's a funny kind of stupid example. But like I said, I'm trying to make light of this dark moment we're in and all. Gaining a new perspective helps us uh, live differently, helps us, attack the current situation with a peace, with a grace, with a knowledge, with a wisdom that we wouldn't have if we didn't stop and take that perspective. So I wrote it this way because Jesus was providing hope forever. We have hope forever through his endless grace. His grace never stops and it hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped. He is still with us. He is right there in that living room with you. He is right there in that bedroom, in that kitchen, in that laundry room. He is right there with you right now. His grace hasn't stopped. Let's continue on. Verse 44. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Now, I want to explain this really quickly. Uh, it, it, before Jesus died on the cross, before he rose from the dead, the Israelite people, whenever they made a mistake, whenever they sinned, they had to bring an animal to sacrifice in the temple. And then once a year, the only the high priest, uh, the high priest that had been elected, the only the high priest one time a year could go into what's this, this place called the Holy of Holies. And once a year, he went into the Holy of Holies. And this place was so reverent, so thick with the presence and power of God that uh, uh, every now and then the high priest, who, who, if he wasn't pure, if he hadn't been, uh, if he hadn't repented of his own sins, if he wasn't, if he didn't do things correctly, like because the power of God was so thick in that room, like he would die. And so they tied a rope onto the high priest so that if he went in there and died, they could pull him out because no one could go into this place. So there was this curtain, there there was this veil in the sanctuary of the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And whenever Jesus died on the cross, in this darkest moment, that curtain was ripped, was torn down the middle from top to bottom. Now we know from other translations, other uh, 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 gospel stories, accounts of this, it was torn from top to bottom. So no human could have done it. It was God himself ripping that curtain down the middle because he was representing something new that was taking place because of the death of Jesus. And that is number three, Jesus in his darkest moment, in his death was giving us direct access to God. We no longer have to go to a priest and then that priest take a sacrifice before God. We no longer have to go through any other person. We don't see, here's the thing. You don't have to go to a church building to to speak with your heavenly father. 
You don't have to be gathered in a building with other believers to speak to your heavenly father. You have direct access to God. Every single one of us has direct access to God. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have direct access to petition him and, and, and to ask uh, him to, to help you, to, to, to uh, intervene in your situation. If you're not a Jesus follower yet, you do have direct access to God to begin to repent and, and, and try and follow Jesus and, and start that journey with him. Every single one of us was given direct access to God in Jesus's darkest moment. See, the darkest moment of Jesus's life He was thinking about caring for and providing for other people. In his darkest moment, he wasn't hyper-focused on himself. He was hyper-focused on other people. See, now is a time for us to use our direct access to God. Now is a time for us to pray. It's a time for us to pray uh, and petition and to go before God in prayer so that we we can ask him for what we need in this season. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the writer uh, of Hebrews says, so let us come. We can come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. So as we pray, we have direct access to God because of Jesus' death on the cross. We get to boldly approach the throne of grace. Boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We'll find the grace to help us when we need it most. Now, some of us, we really need some grace to help us right now. So we have direct access to God because of the death of Jesus on the cross. We get to boldly approach the throne of grace and we get to find grace to help us here and now when we need it most. Ephesians 3, 12, Paul writes this way. He says, because of Christ and our faith in him, because of Christ and our faith in Christ, we can now come, what's that word? Same word, say it with me, boldly, right where you are in your room and you literally say it with me, all right? Your kids will know if you didn't. All right, here we go. We can boldly, boldly and confidently, we can come into God's presence. We get to come into the presence of God boldly and confidently. We don't have to be in a church building to enter into the presence of God, to boldly come before his throne, to boldly and confidently get into his presence and spend time with our creator so that we can find the grace that we need in this season. We can find the grace that we need right here, right now. In Jesus' darkest moments, he was caring for those with less understanding. Jesus was providing hope forever with his endless grace. And he was giving us direct access to the Father. See, when it's dark, the light shines brightest. The darker the the room, the brighter the light. In Jesus' darkest moment, he was bringing about a light that we all get to experience in a light for all eternity. And then we, as followers of Jesus, we are called to bear that light, to be that light. That's what he told his disciples. He says, you, if you're followers of Jesus, we are to be the light. We are the light of the world. You and I, as followers of Jesus, we are the light of the world. So in a dark time and in a dark season, in a defining moment, we can be the light. I love how Paul writes it in Ephesians chapter 5, 8. He says, For once you were full of darkness. For once we were full of darkness. Before Jesus, we were full of darkness. But now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. This is my encouragement to every single one of us is to live as people of light. Yeah, I've shared this before, but this illustration, but I think it's in this season and this time, it's very applicable to us. And that is so many times in life, We live our lives with closed fists, meaning that what's mine is mine and I'm going to hold on to it tightly because I'm afraid I might lose it. And if I lose what I have, I won't ever get it back. And we we kind of, we, we bring ourselves in, we close ourselves and we live our life with closed fists. But now is actually a time for us to open our hands and to live open handed, to not live closed fists, but to live open handed. To live as people of light. People of light live like Jesus. And Jesus lived his life open-handed for other people. So this morning, 
Before we enter into worship in just a moment, Jeff and his son are going to uh, lead us into worship, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, it was awesome for them to do that for us. I'm excited about that. Before we do that, I'm going to pray that every single one of us does two things. One, that we're able to, to boldly come before the throne of grace, that today we boldly ex- come before Jesus and we experience his presence. We open up ourselves to open up our hands and our life to experience his presence. And then also that we live from here open-handed, that we open up ourselves. We don't bring it in and close it off, but we open ourselves up and we live open-handed towards others. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for every single person in our church family. I pray that we live open-handed. I pray that this morning as we enter into worship, as we sit with our families, God, I pray that we would experience your presence. We would experience your love. We would experience your grace when we need it most. And in this moment, we would experience your grace in a time when we need it. And God, I pray that we would live open-handed and we live for others. We would not close ourselves off. We would not think about just what we need, but we'd say, what can we do right now to help someone else just like Jesus? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I love you so much. Hope you enjoy worship today. Hey, good morning. Happy Sunday. Uh, hope you guys are doing great. Hope everybody's well. We are uh, just honored to be a part of my worship this morning. Uh, this is my son, Justin Otwell. He's going to be uh, helping me lead worship, worshiping with you guys this morning. And I know we're still doing the social distancing thing, um, but we still come together in any way possible, it's on the internet, however we're going to do it. We're going to come together as a church, and uh, we're going to worship. We're going to worship Jesus. So uh, before we start our worship, I'd just like to open this up with a word of prayer. God, we just thank you so much uh, for today, Lord. Uh, Lord, I thank you for technology. I think, thank you that we're able to come together uh, through whatever medium that we can find and connect, uh, connect with each other connect with you uh, corporately and worship you, God. And Lord, right now, there's so many people in our country that are hurting, so many people uh, in our state, in our city, or that's hurting. We just lift them up to you, God. Uh, we just pray for sickness to be removed. Lord, we pray for fear to be removed, anxiety to be removed, Lord. Lord, you just give us your spirit. Lord, you said that in your that that was that was one of the most important things that we could have present with us is your Holy Spirit. It was the most important thing. So today, is uh, as we worship you, as we lift up our voices and these instruments to glorify you, Lord, I just pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit on this church, on our state, and on this country, God. We just turn our eyes, we turn our attention to you, Lord. You are so great. You are so awesome. We love you. We give this worship to you today, God. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You are hope. darkness. 
are you Jesus we raise our voices God we raise a hallelujah we magnify your name Jesus